Hi, I'm Tony Williams, and this is Brooklyn Savvy. Hi, I'm Tony Williams, and welcome to Brooklyn Savvy. We are going to be talking to Dr. Ceci Davidson about some of the work that she has done when in the domestic violence space. And there's more that I want to say about you, but let me introduce our Savvy panelists first, and then we're going to dig right in, Ceci. We have Nomiki McCrillis, Maria De Longoria, Phyllis Whitethorn, and Colette Ellis. I want to talk a little bit about how you were introduced to me. And you were introduced to me by a woman named Dr. Toby Stein, who was so thrilled at your work, especially when it came to this play, Baby Doll. And what thrilled her was the authenticity of it and the fact that you just integrated community into a story around domestic violence. And you created safe spaces for women to talk about some of the, experience, the experiences they've had with domestic violence. So why don't we, since my panelists probably have not had the opportunity to see your play, tell us a little bit about Baby Doll. I think the best way to introduce your, you ladies to this work is to give you a moment to experience it. I want to bring you into Clara's world with um, actually some objects and set pieces from the play uh, so that you can feel some of the emotions as much as possible that she was feeling on the day she decided to leave her husband. So in order to accomplish that, the first thing we need to talk about is the idea of an, a weapon. So imagine this sleeve filled with a machete. Now we all know in recent days. So that's what that is. I didn't yes, even realize that. a machete that. goes yeah, in okay. here. Mm -hmm. Um, in recent days, there was a woman who was decapitated by her mm -hmm. husband, and then her child was um, had her neck slit. Mm -hmm. So this is an obvious weapon. I would say this is probably an obvious weapon, too. It's sharp. It can stab. You can cut. It can be dangerous if you choose to use it in that way. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about what an, a weapon really is. A weapon can be any object that's used with intention to harm someone. Hmm. With that in mind, this is the weapon that was used on Clara. One example. In fact, this was the weapon of choice. In one part of the play, she asked her husband to use the loafers because the heel is softer. It doesn't have a steel tip or heel like his construction boot. So when he aims it and he strikes her and he beats her into submission, she's going to be in pain, but not as much as if he had a steel toe. That just, leaves you pretty speechless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah wow, right. So yeah. I'm going to just pass some of the things mm -hmm. around. Um, so. Again, this is the day that she decides she's going to try her best to leave her husband. And she's done all kind of things, like count the number of steps for him leaving the house, counting um, the number of minutes it takes him for, to get from the bottom of uh, the apartment building to their door. She's done all of those things. It all depends on where he decides to buy his shoes that day. Because it's his birthday, and he wants a new pair of shoes and he's going to bring those shoes home and break them in on her. Every day, Clara writes in her grateful book. Her grateful book? Her grateful book. What's she, she grateful for? Well, she's grateful this day, November 19th, 2019, to still be alive. Hmm. I don't think that's enough, but anyway, yes, continue. All right. So this is what I learned from uh, the 26th Precinct mm -hmm. and the officers that worked with me in constructing this experience for um, the library patrons, is that a world is created around a woman when she's in a domestic violence situation. And that's the world that she knows. That's her experience. She doesn't know 
anything else. She gets caught in it and entrapped by it. She has a suitcase filled when with- When you say she doesn't know anything else. Yes. What does that mean? Meaning you can be in a domestic violence situation and have had better relationships, can't you? Can't that have been a possibility? Or is this this character, that's all this character knows? Well, what I've learned mm -hmm. over time, not as a playwright or a therapist, but as a woman, mm -hmm. the reason women stay in this situation and the reason women leave is the same. You stay for fear, you leave for fear. You mm -hmm. stay for love, you leave for love. And what has to end up is that you love yourself more. You may believe that your husband, your boyfriend, your intimate partner really needs your love because that's the only place he can get it. But you get to the point where you are so fearful for your life and lo so loving of yourself that you realize that you have to come first. Mm -hmm. So this suitcase is filled with things like her underwire bra that he picked out that she wore on her wedding day the first time she was beat up. His favorite lingerie used to be her favorite as well. But now every thread feels like it's filled with memories of pain. Her favorite blue bra. He used to like it because it matched the heels. But today, on the day that she leaves, she's going to use her shoes. To walk out. To walk out. Not hit him over the head. And <laughs> defend herself. Right. If she has to. If right. she has to. If she right. has to. So what inspired the work? What inspired it? Mm -hmm. So um, I have, um, I don't know if it's an unusual way of a process for a playwright, but I don't go out seeking things to write. I allow them to come to me. Mm -hmm. So when they come to me, I just try to not intellectually get in the way. I try to feel the work with my, my soul and whatever empathy I can start to feel for the characters. So this story evolved over time, and it was only when I realized that the audience just couldn't go home alone. No, you have to talk this, this out. This has to be right. talked out. But it yes. needed to be talked out in a way that was productive, not just... just and respectful. Um, respectful, allowing and all safe. the... <laughs> safe, allowing mm -hmm. all the voices in the room mm -hmm. to be honored and respected and to have an environment where you could have both victims and perpetrators in the same room. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And we that's were hard. able to accomplish You said that. that's hard? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? Let's yeah. go. Victims and perpetrators in the same room. I just yes. can't. I mean, I, I know what happens, right? And, but yes. it's just that, that thought process. And yes. Especially if they're not there yet. Right. But I right. think through the, the, the play, each identifies with their role within their characters whether it's the perpetrator or the victim. And I think that's the first step for moving forward to thinking about their behaviors or identifying with yes. the characters yes. and, and opening a dialogue for what's going on, what, kind of stepping outside of themselves mm -hmm. to I see agree. what's going on in right. that moment. So whether they're mm -hmm. there, whether it's the abuser or the victim, they're there to see something that's out of themselves, which sometimes helps it become a reality. It helps you let it in. I agree. And it also can give a moment to self-reflect and realize yep. that you are just part of a cycle. Yep. The victims mm -hmm. become the perpetrators, the per perpetrators right. become the victims. Right. And I see this so much with children who they mm. bully, they're aggressive, mm -hmm. they're acting out, they're angry. I've seen two-year-olds who say, I hate grandmother, I want to kill her. Mm. Two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So where is this coming from? Right. You've observed the violence and you internalize it, you mm. might become another perpetrator or you might withdraw into yourself and hurt your own self. Now, what All made this so possible. unique is the integration of the domestic violence unit 
at the police department. Talk yes. to us about what these breakout sessions looked like. Well, I've been very <laughs> fortunate in um, my ability to work with uh, an insightful library manager mm -hmm. who believed that art could really transform lives. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the 26th Precinct um, was just phenomenal. There's no way that this, this kind of experience could have happened without the cooperation of domestic violence unit. And in fact, I remember in the library with all the patrons sitting around um, after the play saying, you know, we need to get back to that kindergarten space mm. in our life when we believed in community helpers. And in this case, the police, unfortunately, are out there doing their job, preventing black women from being assaulted and murdered, other women, but I'm thinking specifically about this play, which was written about a black man um, assaulting his black female partner. Hmm. And in New York City, black women are the largest group of women who die through homicide and domestic violence. Some would say and that's that, attributed to racism. Whatever it's attributed mm -hmm. to, it's the racism and then and the trauma that results from it. I'm just saying some of the research right. that I've read. I think we could all point to trauma for mm -hmm. many different Absolutely. reasons. Absolutely. Does it, it doesn't give black men a pass. You to got kill that black right. Women. No, you are absolutely it correct just about that. Doesn't. But no, it absolutely does not. Yeah. And and it can be because the black woman can be with any partner. Not, not just black, yes. black men, yes. right? So mm -hmm. that sense of Wait a minute. Violence. You mean, you yes. mean that we're being right. <laughs> assaulted by everybody? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I you mean, know, oh, I should man. qualify. Mm. I don't know the statistics yeah. in that that detailed a way. Mm -hmm. I just know, I mean, I don't know. They're male partners, are they, you know, German? Are they, you know, yeah. whatever they are. But whatever they are, they need to stop. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and black, I don't, you know, um, that statistic of why are black women the most? Why are we the largest mm -hmm. group of women? Why is that happening? So there's something that's happening on, um, you know, the legal level, but what's happening to us spiritually and what's happening to our souls in our relationship when this is the way that the men decide to solve whatever they're trying to solve or express whatever they're trying to express. So you've written a lot of plays. Well, I think over 250. Yes. And I noticed in reading some of your work that it is somewhat focused on different traumas. And, but there's a way out, so to speak. Yes. I mean, they're triumphant traumas. But yes. so why do you write from that place that's so raw and taunt? Uh, I'm compelled to do it. Um, I, I came th into this work unexpectedly. Um, my whole adult career was basically as a speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. And that is providing diagnosis and therapy for children who have learning disabilities and communication problems. In that process, I had, uh, I've cultivated compassion, empathy, the ability to listen. And my whole adult career focused on helping people communicate. So I believe that's what fuels my writing. That's how I entered and that's what propels me. Not that I'm listening to someone's story and copying you know, what I write into a play. It's more the e emotional journey of triumph, of suffering, of complications, of things that are supposed to be love but aren't love, things that are supposed to be hate but they're deeper than that. They're, they're hiding um, pain and hurt. So being in this, um, affected by this kind of environment fuels me to keep writing. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I have yeah. many more to write, and I'm looking it's forward to them of, getting into literature. It's part of your mission. I mean, as a it's, professional it's, within yes. your career, you're yes. an effective listener. Yes. And then 
translator and communicator of what you're hearing, and you're putting it out there in a very creative way through your plays. Thank you. And and it's really making the audience, even though it's raw, as Tony mentioned, and it's difficult, the creativity behind it is what makes it accessible mm -hmm. and bearable for the audience. Bearable. Oh, thank you. Bearable. Yes, thank yes. You. through mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. understand, and then take, whether they identify, whether they learn, whether to take from it and, and then create dialogue and thought, which is where we move towards change. So it's, right. an, it's an amazing process thank of you. healing, thank I would you. say. I also write about objects who are personified as people. So I've mm. written about a banana who has a conversation with the banana peel. I've written about a salt and pepper shaker that are getting divorced. You know, so mm. I, I, it's, yeah. it, it's some of my favorite kind of work, work mm. talking about objects, because it allows us to step outside of right. ourselves That's and look at it. What were you thinking? I was thinking that it takes us away from the human. So it sort of makes it a less buffer? raw. A it buffer. is a buffer. Mm. It's not as, you don't feel it as much, but you, are, you get now an opportunity to look at it yes. mm -hmm. more yes. objectively. Yes. It's not human. Right? So that's not right. me. It's not and there's no reflection of me but in that salt and pepper shaker. Across. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I can use it to um, get positive thinking about certain subjects. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's a play called BS, which is about a bagel and a scone sitting <laughs> in a cafe, mm -hmm. priming themselves up, getting ready to be bought. I mean, in the mm -hmm. end, the, the eaters come in and only want black coffee, so they're <laughs> disappointed. Aww, right. <laughs> However, in the meantime, the bagel talks about he's so holy, and beautiful and pale complexion. There's a red velvet cake and they fall in love with the red velvet cake and she gets <laughs> eaten by the barista. <laughs> you know, um, they quarrel That's about true. whether the corn, cornbread should be allowed in the cafe because they're gonna, then they're gonna bring mini bagels, you know, low Sounds carb like cousins. Sounds like night out. Yeah. 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 So, so I talk about gentrification mm -hmm. and privilege mm -hmm. through this, this Parallels. Yeah, mm -hmm. this parallel mm -hmm. universe mm -hmm. of a bagel and a skull that talk together. Now, <laughs> one thing that you revealed in a conversation we had prior to here was that you had uh, gone to Montreal. Yes. Share that story uh, with us, the Montreal story. All right. Uh, so I knew something in my life had to change. It's not that there was something that was particular wrong, particularly wrong, but I just felt there needed to be a change. And to make a long story short, I called a convent in Montreal. Um, I got on the phone. I don't speak French. They said, wait, wait, wait. There's one nun here who speaks English. And mm -hmm. so she got on the phone, and she told me she was waiting for me to call. I got in my truck. I drove to Montreal. I took a vow of silence for um, 30 more days. They gave me an apartment next to the convent. He said, the only thing you have to do is eat with us. Wow. Wow. And so Amazing. Um, while I was there, I realized I was supposed to write. Mm -hmm. And I started writing there. And here I am. Wow. <laughs> how, how does your muse come to you? Uh, it can come from anything. It can come from a color, from an object, a word. Somebody says to me, I... Um, I saw a young lady with a, a large scar on her arm, and I was, you know, feeling such pain for this, you know, what happened to you, and are, are you better? And she told me the story, but what stuck with me is she said, my mother told me sometimes scars are there to help you remember. And so I wrote a play called Scars to Remember. So I never know wow. where it's going to come from. The, but I try so hard to fight it, you know, which is sometimes challenging. What do you mean? I have a PhD in the sciences. Mm -hmm. So I Cerebral. have to, yeah. right. <laughs> right, so right. I have to, I have to, it's, okay, that's, and I'm a Gemini, so it, it's, mm -hmm. it's fine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's this, and I have to do writing in that field. And then the other writing, I just, mm -hmm. I start with the scribble and just let it go. And the, let the play come. Your intuition is what lets you go. Yes. yes. I want to speak, though, about trauma. And because so much of your work 
seems to be, that seems to be like a, a, a focus, for lack of a better word. Um, what do you see as trauma? I see trauma as um, an event or a series of events that changes a person psychically, changes their soul, changes their approach to the world, um, maybe out of hurt or helplessness or something they're, they're unable to overcome on their own. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's not a therapeutic explanation. That's how I feel about it and how I've observed it. Healing from it, yeah. how does that occur? With trauma, it's not so much that uh, someone being hit by a train watching it mm -hmm. is, uh, it's tra traumatic for the person that's hit by a train, but different people that are looking at it may respond in different ways, depending on their ability to cope. To cope. Right? To cope. So, to cope, yeah. Right. I was, yeah. The, the phrase that I always think of is that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. sense of when you've been when hurt. You've been and, hurt. And if you haven't been able to heal and, and through that process, mm -hmm. then you may inflict. And that's why I thought it was interesting when you were talking about victims and perpetrators together, thinking yes. that there might be the, the, side, the victim side of the perpetrator, that ability mm -hmm. to now see, mm -hmm. wow, this is where that came from because of their own experience of trauma yes. in the past. Mm. Yes. Maria, I haven't heard from you. What are you thinking? I see your, I'm watching your face, your facial expressions. But <laughs> yeah, I'm no, so, so it, it's, it's a lot. And, and it, <laughs> it's a lot because, you know, as I hear you talking, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, yeah, I'm, no specific people who've been in those positions. Mm -hmm. And so it's bringing up, mm -hmm. yeah. right, those memories and those mm -hmm. traumas, which, mm -hmm. which are kind of, you know. Hard to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. they are. And, 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 and one of the things, though, which isn't so difficult, when I wanted to ask you, yes. when you were saying that you have, like, to compartmentalize yes. your writing, right? You yes. have this and then you have this. <laughs> How easy is it for you to kind of integrate them? Or is it easy for you to integrate the two? And, and because I, I, I know we compartmentalize, but yes. at the same time, it, it's all of who you are, right? And you can't right. really segment out right. some of who you are because it's who you are and it's how you are. And so it, it, do, you, do you blend the two? Do you have any kind of a, a, a process or a sensitization? Or you, do you just go and it, it's comes out of I let it mosh happen. of a both. I let it happen, and I only go back and structure and format, format it, format it um, at the end when I want it to be fully communicated to um, the people who read it or see it. But there are some intersections. So for example, I wrote a play called Scat about an autistic uh, adult mm -hmm. who, instead of using words, was able to scat mm, music. Mm. And that's because his father was a jazz musician and he brought his autistic son backstage to hear the music and experience the music. So the son could play sax, mm. um, but he would only play it for his mother. And so as you know, the play takes place and social services, she's trying to get support for her son who is a genius musician and no one believes it or believes it's a skill. They just see the autism. So my training as a therapist helped me to write autism. Mm -hmm. or, so it's all informing. Authentic. Each thing informs the other. Yes, exactly. One thing, though, I wanted dialogue. to do before we close, I found that your definition of abuse was a broad one. Would you share that? You talked about words, wherever you, it, oh, I see. the way that you spoke about it in terms of not feeling safe. That Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think it, it goes along with my belief in what a weapon is. You mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, keeping that in mind. So there are different mm -hmm. forms of abuse. Anytime that you're using something, an object, even a word for mm -hmm. harm. I thought that was real interesting. Um, yeah. I thought, you know, yeah. Words have power. Mm -hmm. Words can be yes. healing. Words can be medicine. They can also be destructive. Mm -hmm. They can intimidate. They can coerce. Mm -hmm. And when words are used in that way, whether it's a single word or it's a phrase, mm -hmm. it can hurt people. Mm -hmm. It can um, yeah. compel them not to go on to feel helpless. Exactly. And I think we see quite a bit of that. So world. we're about to close. So why don't you talk a little bit about your book, Articulation? Thank you. Okay. This book, uh, oh, I was very excited about this book. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Which is... Um, 
my first collection of plays. I've had uh, single plays produced with other um, people, but I always felt that I was, you know, my work was drowned out. Mm -hmm. So this gave me an opportunity to have everything in one place. This is 10, so it's just a taste because <laughs> I have a few hundred more I want to wow. want to push out into the world. Mm -hmm. So I hope you'll read it and enjoy it. It has um, beautiful handwritten um, drawings, uh, like oh, Veronica yeah. Bunny, you'll see she oh. has human hands, oh. and um, it's fun. And, and one thing I wanted to comment oh, on wow. before we it end, so we great. when I, Ceci and I also did a podcast together, and it was with men, and it's really interesting the direction that the conversation took. Because the one thing one gentleman said was, because you know I got really hung up on the actual physical abuse, they're striking a woman with shoes. And he said, but you have to understand, everything he does, he's getting something out of it. Yes. I've never really thought of it that way, that when you harm someone or whatever it is that you're doing, right. you are getting something out of it. So I just yes. found that, that kind of interesting as well. Not that I want to it's end disturbing. on a negative note. <laughs> Not that I want to end right. on a negative note, but at right. the end of the day, her work, your art, it really helps people, like you said, no, Mickey, and you, Maria, allude, alluded to, see themselves right. in a non-threatening, non-confrontational right. way because you're spectating. Mm -hmm. So I think that your work is really important, and I'm just so happy that you joined us on this episode of Brooklyn Savvy. So thank you, thank Dr. You. Ceci yeah. Davidson. Yeah. So and we're fans. We are fans. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, thank you thank panelistas. You. And that's all the time we have for this episode of Brooklyn Savvy. We'll see you next time on Brooklyn Savvy.